Okay, so we have our new recording going. Um, and I appreciate you guys coming and joining us for, for this session. Um, we're, this is the launch day for Tech Matters, our new um, Tech for Good organization. I'm Jim Fruchterman, uh, the founder and former CEO of School Award winner Benetech, and the founder and CEO of a new nonprofit org, Tech Matters. I was hoping to spend this week at Oxford at the in-person School World Forum, talking to dozens of social entrepreneurs, donors, and impact investors. Instead, we get to do a session with even more folks here at the Virtual World Forum, and that's a big win for equity and accessibility. I should note that this is one of a number of sessions at this year's Skull World Forum, linked to Catalyst 2030, another major collaboration among social entrepreneurs and social leaders to accomplish systems change. Be sure to check out other Catalyst 2030 sessions this week, and there's already been quite a number and the recordings are up. So let me make a few technical points on the presentation today. This session is going to be recorded. We're hoping to get you to sign up for an email list to stay up to date on the very occasional updates from Tech Matters, no more than four times a year, and my past track, track record has been more like annually. Uh, and uh, there'll be more on that on the final slide. Um, my team is standing by for questions because we've experienced a chat attack. Um, uh, the questions are going to need to be emailed to info at techmatters.org, and that way I'll get um, one, of my, one of my colleagues uh, to actually ask the questions that they're getting that way. Um, I have my, uh, my key team members here, uh, Joan Malaya, or she, you know, who I think of as my co-founder, but she prefers to be called the other Tech Matters team member who was present at the founding. Um, also, Director of Engineering Nick Hurlburt, um, and Steve Francis, who's the project manager for our Thousand Landscapes program. Um, and I'm going to pause twice to answer questions, uh, roughly at the halfway mark, and then in the last 10 or 15 minutes. Um, and so hopefully um, we'll get a chance to hear what you want to hear about based on what I'm, what I'm covering in the presentation. So I want to start off with why tech matters. Tech matters because of what it can do for humanity, all of humanity, not just the richest 5%. We in the tech industry are really proud of what we've created, how tech can make so many parts of life better. And just about every big social problem we're facing today needs better solutions and a better way to scale up innovations for a large scale impact. The best way to do that is through technology. Uh, but we have to tackle the issue of why the benefits don't flow to everybody. The power to do good matters so much that it's a great reason to start a new nonprofit. And that's why I named the new nonprofit Tech Matters. And we have a new website that we launched today at techmatters.org. We want to see the benefits of technology reach far more people to make tech truly matter for everybody. Of course, this new organization is based on a long history. I'll share my founding story because the launch of Tech Matters is a direct result of my personal journey starting for profit tech companies in Silicon Valley as well as founding and leading for 30 years Benetech, the Valley's leading tech for good organization, and I should note, the physical sponsor of Tech Matters. So the story started uh, at a, basically a venture capital board meeting, not more than 10 miles from here in Silicon Valley, and everyone sitting around the table has invested at least a million dollars in my new startup that I've co-founded with two other, two other uh, tech Techies. And um, we, uh, we had invented a machine that could read just about anything. We were an early machine learning startup in Silicon Valley. And so we could turn just about any machine printed text into basically we're processor files. So we could turn basically pictures of pages into this. And, um, but today at this board meeting, we we're doing a, a new product demo. And so first thing I did is I, uh, I was the demo guy. I took a piece of paper and I scanned it through our scanner, took a picture of the page, our super duper technology, turned that into a processor file, and we sent it over to a first generation voice synthesizer on a PC. And it read it aloud. You know, these are the times that try men's souls. But it wasn't quite that natural sounding. But the demo worked. And so, um, so one of my investors, said, hey, Jim, you're the VP of marketing. What's the market size for reading machines to the blind? And I said, well, 
We think it's about $1 million per year. Thud. That, that question is the one that I've been trying to answer ever since, is, you know, why, why is it that market sizes for social good stuff just aren't what we need? And one of my investors quickly asked the follow-up question, so what's the connection to our $25 million investment in this firm? And I made the case that a million dollar a year break even product would be a great addition that our employees would be part of it, our customers would be happy that we were doing it. But my investors did not buy this. And they vetoed the Reading Machine for the Blind project in that very same board meeting. So Benetech got founded as a direct result of my venture capitalists vetoing that tech for good product for the blind. And they did it for excellent business reasons. And so ever since then, I've been trying to figure out a way to apply technology where it's most needed, but where it doesn't make the kind of returns that Silicon Valley venture capitalists and high tech companies need. Luckily, I found a solution to that problem, and that's starting deliberately nonprofit tech companies, social enterprises as we know them today. Because for a nonprofit, a break even $1 million a year product is a big success, not the dismal failure that it would be in the for profit tech world. So I'm going to pause there for just a second and do a check-in with my teammates. Uh, have we got things under control? I don't think we have stopped people from being able to write on your presentation yet. Okay, but we're not sharing it, so we're good. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you know, uh, people are not missing much with my, my PowerPoint. I'll just go ahead and keep charging forward. But thanks for the update, Steve. Although we're just announcing Tech Matters today, we've been working on it for more than 15 months. Let me explain what Tech Matters actually does. Our mission is to bring the benefits of technology to all of humanity and the planet, not just the richest 5% of humans. We pursue this mission through advocating for technology for social good, by advising social good leaders, building the field, as well as launching new tech for good social enterprises aimed at systems change. On the advising side, we act as the nerd advisor, the chief technology officer, the, the CTO, that most nonprofit leaders, philanthropic leaders, and policymakers don't have. I joke that it's more anti-consulting because the majority of what I'm doing is talking people out of terrible ideas. I'll expand on that later. And once I talk someone out of a bad idea, then I can ask, what are you really trying to do with technology? So often someone is developing or has developed something to meet that need. But the person I'm talking to would not Need that we would not come to know that because the people who might have already developed the technology have no ability to get the word out. The money in the field is just not there. And I just happen to know maybe that the next field over, which doesn't talk much with yours, has already built something that is 90% what you need, addresses the same problem that you have. Or I might know that five groups have tried that and all of them failed. Let's learn from that and if we want to try it a sixth time, maybe we should make new mistakes. And all of this conversation has a point uh, just, just beyond helping people understand what technology can do in their mission to do social good. We're looking for gaps, big gaps, where technology can do something amazing at a systems-wide level. Something that could help thousands of nonprofit organizations or many millions of people, but hasn't been built yet. You see, in industry, people have these kind of platforms available. I mean, if I was starting a restaurant, I would have 50 platforms to choose among. If I start a golf course, I'd have three or four. Because no golf course or restaurant really goes about writing their own software platform. But nonprofits do it all the time. But it's, it's building those missing platforms that I think market failure really shows up in the nonprofit sector, in the social good sector. And that's where I can, I hope, Tech Matters can make the biggest difference. Just in the last year, we found two of these big opportunities, chances to make systems change, to make impact at a huge scale. So now I'm gonna tell you about those two big projects, and then I'm going to be answering some questions that you guys are posing by email to info at techmatters.org. So the first project and this is not an uncommon pattern, um, was because Drew Billamoria, who is a fabulous serial social entrepreneur, uh, another Skoll Award winner, 
She buttonholed me at an Aspen conference summer before last and had said, Jim, you've got to help the child helpline movement. Now, Drew had founded Child Helpline International, which is the parent organization of all of the helplines, uh, 175 mainly national helplines operating in 145 countries. She had founded that after founding Child Line in India more than 20 years ago. And so Drew had actually gone on to start a whole bunch of other things, but she had come back to the helpline movement and, and she understood that they had some big challenges. Um, the members of Child Helpline International, um, they, they have a collective budget of $250 million a year and they take 30 million phone calls a year and they answer seven or eight million of them. And so that's a big opportunity because a lot of kids, young people or adults calling about young people in trouble, they, they were reaching out, but they were, you know, maybe getting disconnected or hung up while being on hold. And so, so there was a big opportunity there. There was also another big opportunity in that 95% um, of these conversations were voice conversations. They were over the telephone. And if people know teenagers, um, they don't tend to use voice calls so much. They tend to use text. And many of these organizations didn't support SMS, uh, didn't support social media platforms. So like, like uh, WhatsApp or um, Facebook Messenger. And so there was a giant opportunity to do something there. And you have to realize that these helplines, they're often some of the best known nonprofits in their country because they often have a three or a four or a six digit short code that is the equivalent of 911 in the United States. So in much of Africa, if you dial 116, you know you're gonna get a child helpline that is gonna help you address the needs of a particular child. So our goal was to actually you know, zero in and build a shared tech platform to help these nonprofits, these child helplines, do a better job. Now, uh, so what we did is with some funding from Schmidt Futures, uh, Eric Schmidt's new philanthropic vehicle, the former CEO of Google, um, we went and thanks to working with Child Helpline International and Giroux, we went and we interviewed 25 mainly national helplines. And we found out that um, they were having challenges with their tech and many of the things that a modern for-profit company would have in their contact center, these helplines weren't getting the benefit of that. They were often 10 years behind the times in their technology or even longer because of being on a shoestring or whatever it might be. And so, um, and they had almost all rolled their own technology solutions. This cult of the custom issue um, that I will talk about later, um, they were heavily customized, which meant they were very brittle systems or that if they wanted to do a new campaign to help kids, they might have to call a consultant and have that add that to their system, which meant that their systems didn't get a lot of upgrades. So right now we're in the middle of building that, uh, that shared platform. Um, we spent the first six months of last year talking to people. We then sat down with a governance group, which is, which is dominated by the helplines. Uh, pretty much exclusively helplines, uh, as well as CHI and some, Giroux and some other people like that, um, helping us decide what to do. We raised some money from um, Twilio and Facebook, the second half of last year, so two, two other tech companies. And uh, we've already done three releases to helplines all over the world that are testing our prototypes. Uh, the software is, uh, is scheduled to become live um, at a national scale in a country by the end of this year. And we had more than 25 helplines apply to be one of 10 countries, 10 helplines that were going to co-develop this software with us. So they are, they are busy testing our software and, they, were, and, they, and they, they cover a broad range from Cambodia and India and Zambia and South Africa um, to uh, the National Child Abuse Helpline here in the United States, uh, as well as helplines from Greece and Italy and Denmark and Sweden. So, so we've got a, a pretty wide range. And so we're very excited about this. So the goal is, and this is where, you know, our vision is, is that in a couple of years, we'll have a one or $2 million a year break even social enterprise that is not a child helpline, but is operating the tech platforms for dozens of national child helplines and where they get essentially the benefit of all of the investment that they're, they're coalescing together and have 
really high functioning helplines and our long-term goal is to triple the number of kids that they help in a year without needing to significantly increase their budgets. So let me, uh, let me switch gears and talk about our second big systems change project, which is the Thousand Landscapes for One Billion People project. And you can tell from the name, it's an extremely ambitious program. And again, here I am, I'm the nerd advisor to social innovators, um, another leading social entrepreneur reached out. She was bringing a coalition of major environmental and conservation groups together around a vision of bringing resources to the subnational level, to local leaders who lived in the places where they were working, places that might be a province or a state or uh, a logical ecosystem like a river basin, where so many of the decisions about economies and sustainable climate change, you know, sustainable economies actually get made. And so Sarah Scher of Eco Agriculture Partners uh, it brought together this group. It includes um, you know, very famous uh, environmental organizations like Rainforest Alliance and World Wildlife Fund and Conservation International. It uh, includes UNDP, um, the giant, the biggest aid organization in the world. Um, obviously Tech Matters is one of those partners. Sarah's Eco Ag par uh, Partners is sort of the linchpin and Common Land, which is a big Dutch environmental NGO. So by coming together, we're, we're basically using that same approach that, that we, well, it's pretty much the standard Silicon Valley playbook. We, we don't try to start by pitching everyone on why they should use a particular technology. We actually go talk to them and say, um, what are you using technology for today? What's working? What's not working? And if you could really dream big, what could technology actually do for you? And uh, they, they brought up some serious options, when we, I mean, issues that when we actually talk to them. And, and Steve and I have been doing a lot of these interviews. Steve has been doing most of them. But uh, starting in November, so just a few months ago, um, we were at a African Landscapes Dialogue where hundreds of local leaders from around Africa were coming together to talk about how they were uh, managing these kinds of initiatives at their local level. And we got a lot of, got a lot of feedback. So things that we've heard from, um, from many of the, uh, the, uh, the landscape leaders are uh, things like data colonialism, a term that I had not heard before starting this project. But they pointed out that as a local leader, you know, it might be the a major landowner or the local governor or the or the head of the national park in in that area or uh, smallholder farmers union they they actually did not have access to the data about the place where they lived that data was overseas or maybe the national government had it or maybe some academic institution had collected it but they weren't actually getting access to it so i think that's that's a big issue that we're going to tackle um, a second piece of this is um is communications and we heard a lot about the desire to, to basically communicate with people um, over social media channels uh, being able to show people videos um, on how to do climate smart agriculture how to how to make more money as a, as a smallholder farmer while using less water um, which is a key issue in so many of the landscapes that we're talking to um, and they also talked about money um, many of these many of these local leaders have got great opportunities, they've, they've got an action plan for the, what they want to actually do, and, um, and they can't access funding, funding that many of us uh, in the, you know, at the international NGO level are actually quite able to access. So the, the challenge here was how could we actually bring this um, into the hands of that? So that combination of access to information, you know, that information that people can actually use in a form they can actually use it, um, helping them develop an action plan that is driven by local priorities and local decision making, and then helping them find the money and find the money in whatever form that makes the most sense. So it might be that um, that there's an international grant available and this has got a good fit, or there may be a national or a state level um, funding mechanism that funds ecosystem services, planting trees, or whatever it might be. Um, it could be that with the right kind of a credit enhancement, this could be a this could be a loan package, and it could repay the debt. Um, it could be an outright um, grant, or it could be, frankly, a for-profit investment that is really attractive if the right people just happen to know about it. So um, we're um, the tech partner in this 
systems change, the systems entrepreneurship effort. And our goal is to build the tech platform that supports these international NGOs that are helping local groups do it. But because it'll be open source software, it'll be available to anyone who might need to use it. And so, uh, and so in terms of the timetable, um, you know, we're about four months into the interviews. Um, we'll come up with a rough technical roadmap in sort of the June, July timeframe, start developing prototypes. Um, and of course, we're not starting from scratch. There are so many great open source projects out there that we think we can integrate in. And we're busy making a tools inventory of many of the tools that are actually out there and being used successfully. So I'm going to pause here and check in with, um, with my colleagues and say, hey, uh, do, do you guys have some questions that have come up so far by email from some of the folks online? And any other advice you want to give me on how to carry out the presentation? We do have some questions. Um, we also got a little help from our friends at Skoll. Thank you very much. Um, two recommendations. Mm -hmm. um, one is that if you're not already in speaker view, uh, which is a little button up in kind of the right-hand corner, turn yourself into speaker view. It'll be a little less distracting. Mm -hmm. I believe I have turned off the annotations. Um, okay. So we'll have to see if the settings that you change in the uh, the main thing actually replicate down to it an active meeting. Okay. So. okay. And do you want me to try to share my slides at the end of the Q&A session here? Uh, at the end of the Q&A, if you, if you want to, you, uh, you can certainly try that again. Okay. All right. Great. So what's the question, John? So the first question is, how do you choose the projects you'll work on? Oh, that's, um, that's a great question. And obviously we're, we're looking for, you know, social impact. So I do a lot of, um, I call it CTO for an hour. So I, you know, I, so when we're talking to someone who, I mean, and we're looking for people who have, you know, a, a tech for good challenge, right? So they have an idea of how technology could actually help them accomplish a major social mission idea. And we get these introductions from peer social entrepreneurs, social leaders all the time, um, donors, donors make a lot of these connections. Uh, and so, so we're, we're basically listening for someone who is, who is needing something. Now, something that we don't do is we're not really a consultancy. So you don't really hire us by the hour. I mean, there are lots of great consultants out there that can do things, but, but we are looking for these, especially these systems change opportunities where, um, where the technology that we're talking about is not going to help just a single organization, but help multiple organizations. Now, I wish I could say we could take on, you know, 10 projects like the two I've just described right now. But this year, um, we're, we're pretty much focusing on making those two projects successful. And yeah, we're hoping to kind of line up what, what new projects we might get started in 2021. Okay, we have another question about, can you talk about your open source efforts and community building? Well, you know, we have as a philosophy, um, open source. Um, and it's, it, and it, it's not, I think, well understood in the nonprofit sector, but it does express a lot of values um, and values that are not, that are not like, let's say, a lot of the standard Silicon Valley companies that people think about that, that kind of grab their data and, and hold on to it and sell it to other people or use it to make a lot of money. We're, we're building open source software to express freedom freedom of people to add onto the software for what they, what they uniquely need so that they, again, hopefully can start 95% of the way to exactly what they need and then just focus their software development on the unique thing that they do. Being open source allows for that. Um, we are especially excited when someone comes to us with a great idea for a new feature and, and has the money for it. So, you know, maybe it's a $25,000 feature and if they can pay for it, then everyone in the community can get the benefit of it. And, um, and so we really, we do see it as a chance to, uh, to express those values and to engage the community. I mean, when we start a project, the governance structure is usually in partnership with the organizations who are actually using the software. So we're not, we're not there to make money. We're there to build a community that is going to together build shared technology and infrastructure that's going to help them all be more successful. And, and, and frankly, something I'll, I'll touch on a little bit more, but often there's a standards opportunity or a glue opportunity 
that is very common in Silicon Valley in industry, but not so common in the nonprofit sector. And we see them, some opportunities there. So I think, I think that open and transparent sort of philosophy shows up in a lot of cool ways. Okay, can you talk a little bit about how the projects are gonna be sustainable? So I actually think this is the thing that we're best at. Um, and, and, it, and it's because of all the experience we've had with Benetech launching many successful and sustainable technology for good social enterprises. And we have sort of the full range of Silicon Valley business models to choose among. Um, and as I mentioned, our goalposts can be much more modest. So in other words, Benetech, you know, if it was a for-profit company with 80 people, as it has, would probably be a 50 or $100 million a year nonprofit, uh, for-profit, instead of the $15 million a year nonprofit is. So we can actually make things very sustainable on less money than people might expect. So, so for us, a break-even project that basically pays for what it takes to maintain the code, maybe continue to host the servers, the cloud capabilities, if it's a cloud solution. Um, we've had things that have been sustainable year in, year out at $300,000 a year or a million dollars a year or five or $10 million a year. And those are sums of money that are very achievable to get. And um, a big thing that we, we try to do, and this is, this is very true of the open source movement as well, many open source projects 5% of the users pay the majority of what it costs or almost all of what it costs. The same thing happens for us. We often find ourselves where the money um, for a project might be coming 95% from North America and, and Europe and a few other wealthy countries and the majority of the users are not in those countries. And that's perfectly okay um, with a, a nonprofit social enterprise because our goal is not to make the maximum amount of money it's to make the maximum amount of impact while coming up with a sustainability model. So usually when we start a project, um, we try to imagine three or four different ways that it's actually gonna be sustainable. Um, part of our rapid learning on, on the project as it's going and prototyping is figuring out who might actually wanna pay for this. And it's not uncommon for us to have a project that is, and, and, and this is true for example of Benetech overall, I think 85% of Benetech's budget comes in the form of revenues. And the other 15% comes in the form of philanthropy. For a nonprofit, that is, that is success. It doesn't have to be 100% paid for. And so our work in human rights uh, at, at Benetech never made more than 20% of its budget in, uh, in revenue because the human rights field doesn't have much money. Whereas the work in disability um, was, was self-supporting from money from the wealthy countries. I could go on and on, but I think that um, you'll hear more from me on sustainable business models for tech for good social enterprises as a result of some of the things I'm gonna talk about in a minute. So Joan, do we have another one or two questions? No, I think I'm gonna let you go on with your um, next section at this point. Okay, and I will- um, but, please, but please do send us questions at info at techmatters.org. I appreciate that. Okay, so now let's see if, if we've got the share going up and how does that look? Let me. Uh... It looks so good. So far, so good. Okay, so now I'm trying to advance the slide deck. Okay. So you guys have just heard about these, and now I'm going to switch gears and talk about um, some of our other exciting work, uh, which is building the tech for good field. So um, a big part of Tech Matters mission is building the tech for good field. Just two hours ago, we announced a six figure grant from Okta, the San Francisco tech company. Okay, the grant was for precisely $100,000, but I just love the sound of a six figure grant. <laughs> anyway, and they're providing us with a grant to have the resources to work on field building. And I'm following in the footsteps of many senior Skoll social entrepreneurs, people like Jordan Casalo of VisionSpring, starting the I Alliance, or Wendy Kopp, leaving Teach for America to start Teach for All. I felt the call to move to more field level leadership. And part of starting um, Tech Matters is, is to do less time fundraising, which I did in my job as uh, CEO of Benetech, and more time helping people and helping build this field. And so um, I wanna be working 
um, to advance the use of technology through the entire social innovation movement. And I can't imagine a new social enterprise, much less a systems-wide initiative, succeeding in 2020 without using tech in a smart way. And I think tech, if, if we're successful, if the larger tech for good field is successful in getting a lot more penetration, I think tech would show up in three main ways. First, um, basic technology capability will be seen as a fundamental requirement of all nonprofits and social enterprises. COVID-19 has taught us that the work from home shift has worked out pretty well for organizations with tech capacity, like us, and is a giant challenge for so many organizations that don't have that kind of capacity. And I think basic tech capacity is a necessity, not a luxury. I think that it's just as fundamental as having an office, uh, at least when we're not in the middle of COVID-19, um, and having you know, mobile phones and the like. These are, these are critical capabilities. The second area is that more and more social enterprises are gonna be software companies masquerading as fill in the blank. Um, just like Airbnb or Lyft or Fidelity are all software companies masquerading as lodging or taxi or brokerage companies, many of the Skoll Award winners are software companies at their core. I mean, Kiva is a software company that does microcredit. Callisto, where, where I'm actually on the board, helps sexual violence survivors, but their su survivor empowerment central value turns on software. And there are so many others where being good at tech is the fulcrum for the entire social value proposition of the organization. And then third, we need software and data initiatives which transcend individual organizations. Just like industry has come to expect great tools for running restaurants or golf courses, we need the same kind of great tools built that help thousands of NGOs focus on their magic, not on whether the software at the core delivering programs work. And that's where I'm focusing the majority of Tech Matters efforts, because I think it's the highest leverage opportunity for social impact given our unique talents, but that won't work if we don't fundamentally change the entire social impact sector to be better at technology, better at software, and better at data. And one of the reasons why I really want to help people do this is because we can't do it alone. There's just so much more need than Tech Matters and, and our roughly 10-person team can possibly take on. So, you know, the first thing that I often talk about is those hour-long conversations, those CTO for good conversations. And I say it's, it's a lot of it is, is, is anti-consulting because we're, we're, we're first talking people out of bad ideas, ideas that people in, in the for-profit world have already figured out are not generally good ideas. But that, that word hasn't filtered out to the nonprofit sector. So there's usually you know, basically five bad ideas that come up over and over again that I know will not work 95% of the time or even 99% of the time. You know, some of them are, you know, the app that no one will download or a blockchain as your first database project or making the one true list um, and why doing machine learning and artificial intelligence is really tough when you don't really have any data to speak of. So I end up, you know, zeroing in on on those kinds of ideas and kind of illuminating, you know, why, why does it only work 5% of the time? And what are the characteristics of, the, of, of, of a bad idea that, that do work 1% of the time? And if you have an idea that looks like that, you should actually do it. And, um, you know, I think, uh, you know, the, uh, the people who, who run nonprofits are generally not technical. Um, People who advise nonprofits often know a lot about strategy and philanthropy, but don't know a lot about how modern tech gets developed. Um, things like human-centered design or agile or lean. Um, or sometimes people ask consultants to build something for them that they've already like said, I want something built like this. And the consultants will say, sure, pay me by the hour. And so it's not only that people are lagging behind in terms of the technology they have, this is, and I, I think of this as the time machine, they also lag behind in, in the way that people build stuff. So, you know, people don't make a five-year plan for, their, for what's going to be in your software. Um, we don't do that anymore in the regular for-profit industry because it doesn't work. Um, and, you know, although I think groups, you know, high-performing um, social enterprises like, you know, the current generation of school award winners, they know this. Um, you know, we just had in the last, I think, about year, um, a book that actually explained 
why this is so, uh, Anne Mae Chang's lean impact. And I certainly would recommend it if you want to understand how this sort of technology development mechanism has changed to doing things. So I see some patterns in applying tech for good that, that we need to address, uh, the time machine, the cult of the custom. Um, I, I fundamentally do not think that your average $1 million a year nonprofit is unlike every other nonprofit and needs to build its own software. Um, we have lack of strategic tech talent. Um, that's, a, that's a significant issue. Um, and, uh, you know, and we ask to take the p tech people that are in the nonprofit sector more seriously, not segregate them off to just be IT people, but actually integrate um, them into our programs. I think, I think that um, you know, a fully modern nonprofit has technology and IT as strategic assets that are fully merged into the program activities, not just a support function. There's so many other things that we have to tackle. I mean, we've got um, negative memes um, that technology doesn't work. And sometimes that's based on real experience. So let's make sure we, we focus our technology efforts on the things that are likely to work. Um, people think it's too expensive, both the technology, um, which often they expect to be free, which very few other things are free, but um, even if it's really cheap, what if it was 2% of your budget? Is that a, is that a reasonable amount? Most, most for-profit companies think it is. Uh, or the people who might be taking a 50% pay cut to work in, in the nonprofit sector but are seen as being overpaid. Um, donors think that it's diversionary from the mission. I mean, many, much of the nonprofit sector's attitude towards technology is because the typical donor does not want to spend money on, on technology because they think of it as overhead or diversionary from the mission. Um, so I think that these are things that, um, you know, I've kind of listed these things as negatives, but I'll be selling them from a positive standpoint. Um, you know, I want to spread um, more information about why, um, you know, the five bad ideas are, 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 uh, are not so good, but maybe what five better ideas might be. Um, and, and I'm just gonna hit them very quickly. Um, you know, do agile, do rapid prototyping, do lean, build technology uh, for rapid learning and not for the enforcement of some rigid and almost certainly wrong ideas about how the world and humans work. It's now possible to afford to get the data to really know what's working, so let's do that. Build these shared platforms that solve most of the tech needs for specific nonprofit fields. This will save so much money and deliver far better tools. I think we need to create more standards, both for, uh, both for data and for process, how to run these processes. Every successful new for-profit tech industry has a handful of nonprofits doing standards and open source glue code. Why doesn't the nonprofit world have the same? For the same reasons. And build on top of modern tools, the modern tech stack. Do not reinvent security. Do not re-implement telecom. Do not set up your own servers. Do not reinvent the search engine. You know, a new for-profit tech startup begins their work with a tech stack that is 95% already done. And that, that startup focuses on their secret sauce, on the magic of their particular idea, and they, they duke it out with their competitors in the top 5% of the stack. Nonprofits are lucky to start 60% of the way on their tech stack, and when you build the other 40% from scratch, it breaks a lot. It doesn't work so well. So I think, um, I think we've done pretty well at covering this. I'm going to just say um, I want to spend more time helping people learn how to build tech for good enterprises, to take the lessons that, that we've acquired from long experience of building Benetech and, and now with some of our new efforts um, at Tech Matters. I wanna spread the word of how to build sustainable tech for good social enterprises that deliver lasting value because technology in the for-profit sector is not a six month project or a two year project. People start enterprises that are going to deliver value for 10 years or longer. And many of Benetech's social enterprises have gone on for, for that kind of a time period. So if, you're, if you have a 10-year vision, if you're going to come to a field and build fundamental infrastructure that people are going to build on top of, you've got to be there for the long haul. And coming up with ways of doing sustainability and how you operate that, that's crucial. So, um, so I'm going to pause there and say, hey, do we have some more questions? We do. Okay, great. Let me turn off screen sharing and I will come back to that later. Okay, so you, great. So you talked about building 
platforms, but a problem with tech offered to non-tech organizations is that they don't have the training to maintain or support these tools. How are you planning on tackling that? So the number way, number one way that we're doing this is to follow what the for-profit tech industry has mainly shifted to, which is software as a service, cloud platforms. And, um, and so then what you need to do to maintain your system is to have a web browser, a modern web browser that operates. And so now that doesn't work for the entire nonprofit sector. Um, and, but I think that the majority of our work has shifted to these cloud platforms. And what that means is, you know, you don't have um, 100,000 users of your software installing it everywhere and having to support everything you can imagine. You might have one version or one version per country that's operating and you have to keep that running. And by spreading the cost of having cloud expertise across 100 national helplines or, you know, 10,000 nonprofits, it makes it affordable to have the kind of tech expertise to operate that and to lower the technology requirements of people inside those organizations. So I think that is, that is the, uh, the main direction now, but you know, we're, we're talking to NGOs that are operating in areas that don't have persistent data capabilities, where they're working in a place where the internet is not on. And there are ways to extend the technology to be able to collect that information and have the, the application still work, but then sync them up once you get back into a place where you have connectivity. But I think this is a, this is a crucial switch that most companies have actually switched to. And I think more and more nonprofits are going to switch to as well. Okay. How would you recommend that NGOs begin incorporating technology as strategic assets in their programs? Well, I think, I think the, uh, the, the most important way is to have uh, a strategic tech person in your management team, someone who's on your side, someone who knows when a consultant is getting you to pay 10 times more than you should pay for something that you, should, you could get for nearly free somewhere else. So I think that's one of the reasons why the talent question is so important, because as you're planning for a future of a program, you should be thinking, um, if I'm the, the person running this program or this social enterprise, and I could have a dashboard um, that tells me whether or not we're actually doing what we want to do, having the impact we're going to have, what would be on that dashboard? That's where your tech partner, and hopefully it's internal or it's someone who comes from the nonprofit sector or has this expertise of working with nonprofits, um, they would say, ah, here's what we could do. And then say, mock it up and say, if, if this is the way it looked, would that actually help you? That's the way that we operate. And we're trying to make that sort of the new normal as opposed to um, something atypical. Okay, uh, will you play the CTO role for social good enterprises on the best tech solution even before the enterprises problem is considered for project support? I'm not sure I understand the question. John, do you, can you frame it a little uh, bit more? Uh, well, sometimes nonprofits think what they need is a tech solution, but they're not necessarily sure what they need in terms of scaling impact and would Tech Matters get involved at that point? Um, you know, again, I, I have these kind of conversations, say, with school award winners or people at conferences or, you know, get connected up through, through their, you know, through, through their peers and say, can you, can you spend an hour talking to someone? And I do that for a lot of exciting social enterprises, right? People who are, who are trying to scale up and are are running into tech problems. And so, yes, we, we often do have those conversations with people and try and help them out. And as I know, sometimes it's telling them, no, no, don't, 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 don't. I know some management consulting company told you to, 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 you should build an app. You don't have an app use case. What are you really trying to do? And I can often do that pretty quickly um, or give people, let's say, more ammunition uh, for those conversations with the people who are doing their technology. Okay, um, how can I convince funders to fund tech in my organization? You know, um, this, has been, um, this has been a big issue um, and it's, uh, it's 
been a big part of my conversations with Schmidt Futures, um, which is one of our large donors, and Okta, um, is that, um, you know, often there, there are actually relatively few donors who actually fund technology for social good. I, I count them on the fingers of one hand. Um, and I think that that has to change. And I think that um, donors, philanthropists, funders, foundations, they trust their peers. Um, so it's not going to be me telling them what they do. And sometimes it's not even going to be their grantee saying what they're going to do. It's going to be hearing from other f funders that a tech for good investment or, or a, a major infrastructure tech play in a field they care about has had gigantic impact on the mission objectives of their philanthropic program. And so uh, I want to be hopefully bringing out some more of those stories because of course I do spend some of my time actually advising um, foundations and policymakers and, and sometimes foundations pay me. I mean, I happen to have a, um, have a great working relationship with the larger Omidyar um, network, especially uh, the Working Capital Fund, um, which, uh, you know, is, is one of our, one of our core efforts is also advising them on their labor rights program. So I think it's, I think it's going to be that, but it, you know, I, th I think that funders care about having the maximum social impact on the communities that they serve. And we have to make a direct line between um, having their grantees consider technology be a core part of that, um, or actually investing in um, the the sort of shared ecosystem kind of plays that are going on in these fields. I think they're I think they're fundamental to these sort of systems change, systems entrepreneurship programs that people are getting excited about. And I think the final point is, donors care about impact, and donors are asking for more and more impact measurements. How is it possible for a grantee to do a great job reporting on impacts if they can't invest money in sort of the technology that's going to help them gather the data to actually find out whether or not they're having an impact? And, and so I, I think, I think that we just have to make these things much more visible. Okay, I'm going to combine a couple of questions here. Um, someone asked about your thoughts on using public tools, um, especially social media type tools versus building your own. And the other question that relates to that mm -hmm. is, when are the times that a social enterprise really should build their own tech? Well, um, I mean, in, in my sort of second of the three bins, um, I described social enterprises where being good at technology for the specific mission that they're following um, is critical. Those organizations are going to build their own tech because, frankly, they're software organizations. I think that a lot of my advice to not recreate technology is to organizations that do not have software development as one of their core competencies, that don't see that as part of their identity. And I think it is very challenging for an organization that doesn't have software development as one of the things they do to go out and successfully develop software. They, they tend to do it badly, or sometimes they do it well enough that they find themselves in the position of being a software company and the ED is going, oh, I, I never expected to be a software company. We're, you know, we're trying to deliver healthcare to the last mile and what, what are we doing writing software and trying to support it, which is a whole nother skill set. So, um, so I don't know, Joan, could, is, is there more of that you'd like me to draw out? Because I think it's that, it's that balancing act is if software is central to what you do, you probably should do that. And if you're a big organization, you're going to have IT in the, but it's that, it's that organization under 100 people. If, if technology is not something you're good at, it's going to be pretty challenging to, to get good at it and see, are there 10 of your peers that have the same problem? And if you work together with them, you're probably going to be a lot more successful. So this relates a little bit to what you just said, um, which is that um, uh, nonprofits generally don't have a lot of tech capabilities. Um, they do keep hearing about some of the hot things like AI and blockchain. Um, what are the best ways for a nonprofit to stay up to date without knowing what technology services are really worth exploring? 
So re- reframe that just one more time. I want to make sure I really, I'm really on it. Um, so if I'm a nonprofit that doesn't have a lot of tech capabilities, mm-hmm. I have people telling me I should be implementing AI. I should be using blockchain. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't have those skills. Um, you may be telling me that I shouldn't be doing those things, mm-hmm. but I am also not aware of what other technology is out there that maybe I should be implementing. What's the best way for a nonprofit to stay up to date? Well, I think, I think there's two, two ways is first, um, like funders, uh, social leaders trust their peers. So try to identify the organization in your field that is using technology effectively and try to understand from your peer, what is it that they're doing right? What did, how did they make that choice? Um, and so, so I think that, um, and you know, it's, it's, I mean, when I was, well, I am still an ED, you know, we trade notes all the time about how to hire a, a chief financial officer or how to raise money from that major donor or how to work with your board. I think that how to work with technology should be more and more one of those key conversations that CEOs have and that program directors have with their peers and so on and so forth. So I think peer learning is a, is a big part of it. I am hoping that we get um, more strategic tech advisories out there um, because obviously um, I don't really want to become a consulting company. That's actually not my goal for Tech Matters as a nonprofit, as a charity, to go into the consulting business. Um, but I hope that we get um, more and more consultancies in this area. And I'm certainly going to try and encourage some people to start those that, that can, can walk people through that. Um, there are a few of them out there, and, uh, and there need to be more. Um, and, uh, but I think, um, and then in terms of, you know, what technologies really do work, um, you know, I think, I think we're going to be seeing more and more of these infrastructure plays that are going to be modeling what can happen in a field. And, you know, and I think that the more advanced practitioners um, are seeing that, that, that getting better at data, getting better at software, getting better at technology is actually crucial for accomplishing their mission. And so, um, so I think, I think it's a field level effort and the field level conversations are gonna drive it. Okay, so that leads perfectly to our last question, which is what nonprofits are you seeing that are doing tech well? Well, um, I mean, a lot of the Skull Award winners uh, over the last few years um, are, are doing tech well. And you may not see, see them as tech, but I mean, uh, let's pick um, a new Skull Award winner like uh, OCCRP. Uh, which is an investigative journalism play. A huge part of what they're doing is being good at data and, and being good at picking up what organized crime is doing by being essentially data journalists. So there's an example of an organization that you might think is a journalism organization, but they're doing it well. Um, oh, I mean, you know, it just, I, just, I just think that uh, in, in, in many of, uh, let's say like the last four or five years of school award winners, a lot of them are doing tech well. Um, and then I'd say that some of the big NGOs are starting to actually identify being great at tech as being a core competency. I mean, the ACLU just had their, hired their first CTO ever, I think two years ago, um, or Planned Parenthood, which has a sexual health chatbot that actually works. Uh, I, I heard about it through, through my network um, called Rue. And so I think we look for these sort of models of where people have actually figured this out and then borrow those models to actually apply them to uh, sort of the needs of our own field. Okay, we're like two minutes before the end, so time to wrap up. All right, well, thanks a lot. Um, let's see, did, the, did my screen go back to sharing? It did. Okay, let's see if I can. Uh, I, first, I wanna acknowledge our, our funders and partners uh, and thank them for all of their support. I mean, obviously you've heard a few of their names um, through this, but uh, you know, we are, we are very lucky to have the kind of support um, that, that we've gotten. And of course, our partners, our partners in, in social change, groups like Child Helpline International, Eco Agriculture Partners, and of course, Catalyst 2030, which is trying to kickstart the, the SDGs into a new mode by scaling up the impact of social entrepreneurs. And of course, I hope that our, our Thousand Landscapes platform being open source is part of that kind of platform that people are envisioning as part of that. So there's a famous quote in the tech industry, the future is already here. 
it's not it's just not evenly <laughs> distributed this is so true in the area of technology for social good we have the data we have the technology we have the business models uh, we have the algorithms we have the people who want to make a difference but they're not necessarily working on humanity's biggest and boldest problems and so i'm hoping that that tech matters can be part of of this larger tech for good movement to make sure the tech matters for all of humanity. Thank you very much for your attention today. Clap, 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 clap. Okay, so let me, um, let me uh, stop share. Well, actually, I'm gonna go to one final slide and also uh, stop recording. So let's see if I can figure out where the video recording is. There.